Hey everybody, Pierre Quinn here. You're listening to episode 132 of the Leading While Green podcast, where my mission is to help you live, learn, and lead with confidence. On this episode of the podcast, I'm joined by Daniel Harkavy, author of the book, The Seven Perspectives of Effective Leaders. Now, before we jump into that conversation with Daniel, I just want to take a few moments to thank you for supporting the Leading While Green podcast. You rate it, you review it, you share it on social media, you send in your feedback. Having your support on this journey has been incredible. This is your first time joining us. Welcome. Here you'll find conversations with leaders to help you on your leadership journey. So I'm so excited about this conversation with Daniel Harkavy. I was introduced to the work of Daniel Harkavy after reading a book he co-authored with Michael Hyatt entitled Living Forward. So I read the book, I took a day to do my life plan. After going through that exercise, I started to look up more about Daniel and his work because I was already familiar with Hyatt's work. And I found that Daniel was coming out with a new book, The Seven Perspectives of Effective Leaders. So I reached out to Daniel and his team and we were able to have a conversation. Now, this was a much needed conversation for me. And I hope you take a lot of notes on this one. There's some moments there even where Daniel's doing some coaching for me, helping to shift my perspective in the middle of the interview. So I know you're going to appreciate it. Soak it in. And after you soak it in, hop in the show links and get your copy of The Seven Perspectives and your copy of Living Forward and find out more about Daniel and his work. All of that stuff that I invite you to do at the end of the show, I'm telling you right now, do it, connect, get the books and and dive deep and get some additional perspective for your leadership journey. So if you have no clue about Daniel Harkavy, Daniel Harkavy has been coaching business leaders to peak levels of performance, efficacy and fulfillment for more than 25 years. In 1996, he founded Building Champions, where he serves as CEO and executive coach and Daniel and his team have worked with thousands of leaders and organizations to improve the way they live and lead. I mean, organizations like Nike and Pfizer and Bank of America and Morgan Stanley and Merrill Lynch and Chick-fil-A, just, just to name a few of the companies that Daniel has worked with. And as an executive coach and confidant, he works with high profile leaders to improve their leadership, improve their decision making, improve their influence and improve their overall effectiveness. Daniel is a sought after author and speaker. And in this conversation, we're talking about his new book, The Seven Perspectives of Effective Leaders. Here's my conversation with Daniel Harkavy. Excited to be joined on this episode of the Leading While Green podcast by Daniel Harkavy. Daniel, thanks for being my guest today. Pierre, it's great to be with you. So reading your bio, it's saying you're drawing on 25 years of experience as a successful CEO, executive coach, and founder of Building Champions. So take me back 26 years ago. What was life mm. like for you 26 years ago? 26 years ago, it was really cool. It was really cool. I was 30. Uh, my wife and I had three kids, all of them at the age of under five. I, after 10 years in banking, quit. I was being groomed to be the successor of the previous firm I was with. And uh, I had like this crisis of faith and belief. And I'm like, I'm out of banking. I was making more money than I ever dreamed of. Uh, I had offices throughout the Western United States and I went in and quit. And 26 years ago, I took a one year sabbatical at 30. And my wife and I had the kids going up and down the West Coast, surfing, Hawaii, living in a, in a trailer uh, more than in our home. Mm. And uh, we were adventuring and we moved from Southern California to Oregon and it was in that one year journey, age 30 to 31, where I had no job, complete freedom, time to focus on my bride and my kids hmm. and really figure out what my calling would be in the decade or decades ahead. So uh, I put together three business ideas, three vision that would all enable me to make a difference in the lives of others and building champions one. So when you look back on what you forecasted for your life was was getting, was achieving that amount of success at 30 part of your vision 
or as you talk about uh, in in the book Living Forward, was that part of your life plan? Was it struck? Is, was it something you thought through? Was it just a series of of good luck? What was the thing kind of guiding mm-hmm. that? And then by by the time you got to thirty, you now what caused that pivot? Yeah. So when I was really young, um, I was quite money motivated mm-hmm. and I had extended family relatives that were wealthy and I was never good at school and I was never good at sports. And I was a surfer drummer as a kid, mm-hmm. which in California meant I was a partier. <laughs> and, uh, so, so I really didn't have a whole bunch of hope. There was a school, San Diego state that was known for letting anyone in and they turned me down. So uh, I had a lot of drive though, and uh, I worked really hard. I started working when I was a teenager, 14 years old. I, I bought my first home when I was a teenager. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I knew that by the time I was 30, I would reach a certain financial level, but I didn't know how I would get there. And um, I wasn't a life planner then. I was hyper-focused on just two accounts in my life. You read Living Forward recently, so you know. You know, that, that, that whole book is around a leadership framework that I've walked executives through for the last two and a half plus decades, where we help you to figure out where you want to accumulate net worth in all areas of your life, not just your career and your finances. Mm -hmm. So I started to really augment the whole goal setting life planning process when I started building champions, Uh, you know, and that was, uh, like I said, 25 years ago. So So. was it, was it what was it about living in a trailer or being camping with your kids or having that moment of clarity that made you think, huh, I want to, I want to coach other people to be successful and have direction and, and achieve their goals. What, what, what steered you in that direction? Did you have an awesome coach uh, in your past where you introduced to coaching by like a guru? What made you say, huh, this is probably a direction that I, but that I feel inclined to go in. So Pierre, I'm assuming no one's seeing us as they're listening to us. No one seeing us. Behind you, <laughs> you know, behind Pierre, all of you listening are um, hundreds, if not thousands, of books. And uh, Pierre's a student, obviously, which is how he and I have connected here. Pierre, there's a book I want to add to your bookshelf, and I'll send it to you. So you get us your address after the show. And it's a book I wrote 15 years ago called "Becoming a Coaching Leader," hmm. and I'll put that one into your hands. Um, that tells my story. So in a quick nutshell, yeah, I was given the opportunity to manage when I was just uh, 22, 23 years old. And I knew nothing about management. Mm-hmm. I knew nothing about it. Um, and this was in the mortgage banking world. And I was really good as a loan officer. Um, I had uh, in, in a short period of time, really got in the knack of that and was doing amazingly well in my young 20s. And they gave me an opportunity to manage but I didn't know really how to do it. So my philosophy was go out and find humble, hungry, really smart, young, talented people and um, help them to figure out how to accomplish what they want to accomplish. Mm -hmm. So I started meeting with them and coaching them before I knew I was coaching them. And I would take copious notes, who they were, what they wanted to do. I kept a Wilson Jones columnar pad, you know, a little notebook. I'd (laughs) staple their business card on it. I would meet with you, Pierre. And I'd say, Pierre, tell me, why do you do what you do? Pierre, five years from now, who do you want to be? Pierre, how are you going to get there? Pierre, what's good? What's holding you back? What are your fears? If What do you need now in order to be more successful? And I would listen and write and listen and write. Our meeting would end. And before it would end, I would say, Pierre, you know what? Um, you're the kind of human that I want to hang out with. Regardless of what happens with your career, my career, I'm not trying to offer you a job, but uh, I like the energy. And if I can help you to accomplish what you want to accomplish, that would be great for me. So how would you feel about meeting again in another 60 days? Mm -hmm. And Pierre would shake his head and go, of course, Daniel, why not? You want to pour into me? Yes. I'd leave our meeting. I'd read through my notes and I'd figure out how to add value to you. I'd go back to my office. I'd send you a book based upon what you wanted. You told me you were interested in this type of music. I would send you something. I would follow up with you. I would encourage you. All of a sudden, I'm doing that with all of my competition. I'm doing it with all sorts of people working for my competitors. And then what happened was they all realized that Daniel over at the shop down the street added more value to them, cared more about them than did their leader. And Mm. one by one, they all joined me. Then what happened was there were 
more than 200 of these loan officers in the business throughout the Western United States. Within two years, six of the top 10 all worked with me. Wow. So I figured out the secret sauce, dude. It's just encourage people, find something good in them, and then work your butt off to help them to flourish and succeed. That was my leadership strategy. Fast forward, now I run production. I run 17 offices throughout the Western United States, and uh, it's all I wanted to do. So, you know, I take the one year off and coaching yeah, uh, wasn't a thing back then. There was no such thing as executive coaching back in the n- mid 90s. You know, maybe a few people did it, but uh, I figured out how to only do that, create a business where all you do Monday through Friday from eight in the morning until four in the afternoon, all you do is pour into people and make them better. Man, so let's let's fast forward because we're reading the uh, the praise for the book uh, in those first few pages. And I mean, Daniel, it, it lists like a who's who. Let's yeah, be completely well. honest. It, you got got names of people, companies, worked at some of the top companies uh, or, you know, retired for some of the top companies in the world. I mean, you got names like Home Depot and Chick-fil-A. Yep. You got a big name in the personal development and leadership space, like, like a Michael Hyatt. And, and all of these people who the beginning of the book are singing really the praises of your impact over all of these years. When you think back to that moment when you were 30, that year off, trying to figure out what was next, till to now, when you have those names in the beginning, when you flip through the beginning of Seven Perspectives, what are some of the feelings that emerge when you reflect on that? There's a dominant one, my friend, and it's immense gratitude. I can't believe how God has allowed me to uh, journey through the last two and a half decades. I mean, mm. I I have favor on my life. That's all I can say. I work hard. Yeah, and uh, I start my days face down and and uh, acknowledge what I can do and what I can't do and who's in control. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I have a daily prayer, and you know, I, I know who you are just uh, as a result of our earlier conversation. But included in my daily prayer, I, I, every day I just say, may I be used to, f- to flip the switches up on the hearts of everybody I meet. May you be the one that gets the fame and the glory. And may I strive to please an audience of one. Hmm. And that's a part of how I start every day. So here I am at 56 and I have a lot of energy. And my, my hope is that I get to do this for another 25 years. Um, I would love that. I've got people on my team, you know, building champions as an executive and leadership development coaching company. And there's coaches throughout the country that are all on my team. And some of them are in their seventies and uh, they have energy and they are passionate about making a difference. So I look at that and yeah, what I experience is just immense gratitude all the time. How'd you come up with the name building champions? So uh, that's another good story. So there was a book, hang (laughs) on here, hold on real quick. You need to see this. You need to see this. So this is an old book that's out of print and it's called Learning to Lead by Fred Smith. Hmm. And it is a great book. I mean, if you can get your hands on this one, add it to your shelf. And on the front of Learning to Lead is this embossed gold torch. I don't know if you can see this, Mm -hmm. but check that out. It's a torch. It's like for you guys listening, Mm -hmm. guys and gals, it's the Olympic torch. It's a hand holding up the torch. And I really liked it. And I thought, you know what? That to me depicts somebody holding up a light to illuminate um, to illuminate a path going forward. So, so that torch, what it showed me is, you know, we have the ability to hold up a torch to illuminate the path for others. And I loved that. And I loved that Olympic kind of, um, I don't know, connotation with that. And when I looked at my past career, when I was in my twenties, if you were to look at the people that I had poured my, my life into, they became really champions in business and in life, meaning just the best of the best. They, Mm -hmm. and, and and then when you look at the meaning of champion, you know, many people think a champion is the winner, but also think about to champion, Mm. to champion a cause, to be an advocate, right. To be an encourager. Well, 
I knew that if I was the only advocate, the only encourager, the only champion, then my influence only goes so far. And I've always been a guy that loves multiplication more than addition. Hmm, yeah. So I'm going to build champions. I'm going to build encouragers who then take the platform of leadership and they create cultures or environments that are life-giving. Because Pierre, if you look at us humans, the majority of us spend the majority of our waking hours doing this thing called work. Yeah. Now, the experience we have Monday through Friday, if it's a good one, we go home to our wives and husbands and, and kids and neighbors and family, and we go home and we bring good energy with us, right? Mm -hmm. But if we got a crap boss and we got yeah. crap culture, yeah. well, then we go home, we kick the dog and we throw a drink back and we you know, hide ourselves in some TV show and you know, maybe that's all extreme. But you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. So goes the leader. So goes the people. So goes your job. So goes your life. We spend the majority of our waking hours doing this. So I wanted to build champions who would create a better experience for the humans that they got to serve and lead. Mm -hmm. There you go. So what said to you as a part of this mission you know, to build champions that the next step in this in this influence and impact that you and your team are having literally around the world, what said the next step was now to write this book, Seven Perspectives of Effective Leaders? So this book is six years in the works, and mm -hmm. it used to be the five perspectives. When I first started, there were five. And what wasn't there was the outsider, nor was there the customer. Mm -hmm. Those weren't there. Mm -hmm. The customer was included in current reality. And the outsider didn't exist. Uh, I was on another podcast earlier today and I shared the story of um, how my wife and I joked. She would rib me a bit saying, you know, what makes you think there's only five perspectives? And I could be like, babe, there's only five. When I was young, I was fortunate to work with John Maxwell, who's a thought leader in leadership. Mm -hmm. For those of you who don't know, he's written more books on leadership than most and great guy. And, and I used to do a lot with John back in the late nineties and the early two thousands. And every book John wrote was like, you know, the, the 17 principles and the 21 irrefutables and the, this and that. And so Sherry would rib me a little bit, my wife, what <laughs> makes you think there's only five? I'm like, there's only five. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh darn, there's six. I was working <laughs> in businesses with this framework and model to help leaders to think better and to perform better. And I was going to write the book when there were six, I mm -hmm. thought about writing when there was five, but I didn't have peace. And then one yeah. day I was in the shower and uh, all of a sudden I was, I was reflecting on my previous few days where I had spent full days with executives. And I was just thinking about how good it was to be their thinking partner, hmm. to just really think with them and to help them to make sense of their current reality and their vision and their strategic bets and their team moves and, and how they were going to serve customers in the decades ahead. And, and all of a sudden it hit me. I was like, you know what? these guys and gals just pay for my perspective. Hmm. It's the seventh perspective. And I stuck my head out of the shower and I just shouted to my wife. I'm like, babe, there's seven perspectives. I'm done. It's seven. It's perfect. It's brilliant. And she laughed at me and you, know, you can't <laughs> argue with the number seven, buddy. That's the number of perfection. So right. off to the races, I wrote it. And, uh, and here we are. You, you frame the beginning of the book and Man, with just such clarity in the beginning, because I know a lot of us who who have read it or those who are going to pick it up as a result of our conversation, see ourselves or have seen ourselves in our professional career as a person who at one time, and we've had incredible influence in our companies, in our organizations, in our nonprofits, wherever we serve and lead, incredible influence, but like we just stayed away from tough de decisions or, you know, we in terms of making tough calls, we knew the, we had the right answer. We were fearless. We made it happen. But in terms of people accepting us or even recommending us for a higher position of, of leadership that combined the two, we were, we were missing. What made you start the book with that dichotomy between having a lot of influence, but not being keen on decisions or being keen on decisions, but not having a lot of influence? Yeah. So I, I'm the kind of guy, um, you know, I have no college degree. I went to a community college. I, I made it through high school, but not with any honors. Um, I'm the kind of guy that wants everything simple and straightforward. Hmm. 
and I have a belief. And my belief is that what is simple and straightforward is easily understood. Hmm. And what's easily understood is then easier to execute. And what's easier to execute gets results. So I'm going to put everything on one sheet of paper. Nice. That's me. Yeah. A one page business plan, your vision that answers three B's. Uh, you know, you you build mm-hmm. everything as simple as you can so that all of us who like to grab, you know, the the nuggets from the the low altitudes, we get it. All right. The premise of the book is this: a leader's effectiveness is determined by just two things: the decisions you make and the influence you have, nothing more. Hmm. For six years, I've been in conversations, whether it's with the chairman of Delta Airlines, the CEO of Chick-fil-A, executives at Nike, Bristol Myers Squibb, you name it, Mm -hmm. you name it, right? And we get into conversations because many of them are in the book. And I say, guys, gals, leaders effectiveness determined by just two things. Prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. Let's get into a debate. I'm going to write a book about this. I need to be right. (laughs) <laughs> if I'm wrong, tell me now, yeah, right? Yeah. So we get into these conversations and one of the greatest stories um, was uh, with Frank Blake, who is now the non-executive chairman of Delta Airlines. He was mm-hmm. the former CEO of Home Depot. And just a few weeks ago, Frank and I were talking and he said, you know, Daniel, when you said, when you said a leader's effectiveness is determined by just two things, decisions and influence, he said, I agreed. And he said, then you said it again. And I challenged it. He said, in my mind, I was like, wait a minute, is that right? Hmm. Is that really right? And he said, I just kind of thought about it. And he said, Daniel, then you said it your third time. And he said, I thought not only is he right, but it's brilliant because that's all leadership is. So strategy, succession planning, alignment, execution, uh, supply chain, turn times, inventory, quality assurance, quality control. I can pick out every business function, the decisions you make and how connected you are to the realities of those, how knowledgeable you are, enables you to make great decisions. And if you make great decisions, sometimes the decision being, I'm not the one to make the decision. Pierre knows more. You make the decision, Pierre, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The quality of my decisions directly impacts my influence because my team's subconsciously buying in as a result of the decisions I'm making and not making. And not only is it my team, but it's my clients. It's all key constituents. A leader's effectiveness, just two things. I was with Horst Schultze. He was one of the founders of Ritz-Carlton Hotels, also in the book. Great friend, great guy. And you know, if you've ever heard Horsty, if you haven't, you need to listen to him. But Horsty's got this very, you know, very thick German accent. And he said, no, Daniel, you need to have integrity and character. And I said, no, Horst, that's not required for leadership effectiveness. <laughs> I said, that's required to be a leader. Like you, your yes is better be yes. Yeah. Your no's better be no. If that's not true, well, then we shouldn't be talking about leadership effectiveness. We should be talking about why are you leading? Mm-hmm. Are you a good leader or a bad leader? Not an effective leader, right? Yeah. So let's just go in with the assumption that your, your yeses are yes, your noes are no. You have a heart and a head that is all about making a difference in the lives of those that you serve and lead, as well as those that use your products or services. Now let's figure out how to get effective. Look at your business from seven perspectives. Be intentionally curious. Be rigorous in those first five. Those first five will impact the six, get the help of the seventh, and you're going to make great decisions and have great influence. You mentioned this this idea of intentional curiosity. Now, some people may may wrestle with that. You know, how do how do we foster intentional curiosity? Some people say, you know, when I think of curiosity, I think of uh, creatives, or um, they say, well, I don't need to be curious. I staff curiosity so that I can only pay attention to these things because I'm staffing my weaknesses and doubling down on what I'm supposed to be doing. How, how do you help leaders wrestle with the, the benefit and how to maximize intentional curiosity? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know, Pierre, if my job's really to help those people, hmm. because what I observe is that the best of the best are the most curious. It's just in them. Yeah. So in order for people listening to us to understand what I'm talking about is and knowing who your audience is, yeah. let me give you all the gift of my 47th year 
Hmm. When I turned 46, okay, at the end of every year, I take what I call a little sabbatical and I do a year of review. I update my life plan like I talk about my book, Living Forward. I try to capture the big lessons and insights of the year, what I did right, what I did wrong, what were the big things that I can then grow from. And, and in, in 10 years ago, 11 years ago, I turned 46 years old. And I remember like as clear as day, this huge smile on my face when I realized I just don't know that much. Hmm. And, and I even joked, I'm like, Harkavy, you're kind of an idiot. Now, some might hear that and go, well, that's not good. You don't want to give yourself a crappy label like that. No, no, no. It was freeing. It was liberating. Buddy, look at all the books behind you that I've not read. Mm -hmm. Look at all the subject matter experts that authored those books. Look at the people that can, that can open up the human body, repair it, and, and fix it. Yeah. If I stood in that surgery in that operating room, I'd faint. I don't know how to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Look at the work you're doing. I don't know how to do what you're doing. I look at my clients that are leading multinational global organizations. I get to coach them. But if we ever had to switch roles, those companies would tank. Hmm. My job is to coach. So once I realized at 46, I just don't know it all. Well, that did two things for me. First is I don't need to act like I know it all. Hmm. Yeah. I need to ask for help all the time. As a matter of fact, I'm starting a new organization, just started it a week ago, where we're going to make a significant difference in the lives of the youth. And I don't exactly know how to do it. And I'm going to ask you, Pierre, for help, because I think you might be able to help me. I am now like absolutely unashamed to beg for help. Hmm. So think about this. I'm curious because I'm humble in knowing I don't know it all, right? So if I can walk into a room and there's a big behemoth problem, my job is to articulate the problem. Hey, here's the problem. And then my job as a leader is to tell everybody how I want us out of the problem. Like we need to get out of here or we, yeah. we need to capture the opportunity. But then I look at everyone and go, and folks, I, I don't exactly know how to do it. So that's where you all come in. <laughs> Let's figure this out together. Right? Yeah. What do you think? What do you think? Intentionally curious. Why do you think that? What do you think about doing it this way? Is there another way? There's a great quote, and then I'll, I'll let you chime hmm. in here. There's a great quote. It's one of my favorites. It's by a Nobel Peace Prize winner, Najib Booz. And if you read Living Forward, you know I quote him in there. But I, I, I love the quote because he says, you can tell a man is wise not by the answers that he gives, but by the questions, questions. he asks. Mm -hmm. hmm. Intentional curiosity. You, you mentioned that you don't know if it's your job to help those people who don't who don't already have a process for fostering intentional curiosity. I want to ask, what are the what's the criteria? Because I'm sure there's a lot of recommendations for building champions. There's a lot of people. Hey, you got to work with Daniel and his team. What's the criteria of actually working with an organization or coaching a leader? And what are some of the things that, it, that made you say, mm, this is not going to be a good fit? Hmm. Great question. Yeah. Um, there are some people, and this is really one of the beauties of the last 25 years. There are some times where we have somebody sent to us mm -hmm. who's a problem child. Mm -hmm. The organization is about ready to fire them, but they're going to go ahead and they're going to do that one last Hail Mary kind of effort and get them a coach. Yeah. And most of the time we walk away from those like, yeah, no, 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 no. The guy or gal's 52 years old and they have identity issues and you know, they're really, really rough around the edges. And if they don't want to work with us, then don't you pay for them and waste your time or effort. Just bolster up the courage and make the decision, right? Hmm. Our clients are awesome. Yeah. They're just awesome. They're the kind of people. I just wish you could have been on a webinar that I did with the launch team for the seven perspectives. There was a guy on there. Shout out to you, Johnny Gallagher. John learned about us by listening to a CD in 2002 from John Maxwell <laughs> and John Gallagher listens to the, uh, the CD. And he would, he, he would tell you, he just shared it. So it's going to be social. He's like, I was in trouble at work and, and I needed help in life as well. And he worked with one of my partners, one of our coaches for a decade, and they become wonderful, dear friends. The adoration that he has for his coach, who is now one of his truly best friends hmm 
Yeah. It was birthed out of a, a coaching relationship, a professional relationship where he needed to grow as a leader. So what we're looking for is good, humble, hungry leaders who want to make a difference. And they saddle up to the table and they're like, hey, I don't know it all. Help me. Help me yeah. to think better. They're confident people. They've accomplished a lot. But they're, they're people that are climbing the mountain. They're halfway up. They just want to get to the top further faster. And they want to benefit from the outsider, that seventh perspective in the book. I want you to talk about kind of do a deep dive uh, or well, a quick scan for us of the the seven perspectives. But but I'm going to ask you to spend a little bit more time on the first one, because at wrestling with emerging leaders, we're always well, a lot of us are thinking about future and retirement and building an awesome business and being known widely and being influencers and, you know, pushing things in the marketplace. But sometimes we wrestle with that first one. That first perspective is a doozy. And I know it's sometimes a challenge for the people you've coached over the years. Key us in on that first one. And, and why is that a linchpin uh, to whatever comes after? Great. All right. Let's fly through the seven perspectives. Again, premise. Your effectiveness is all determined by the decisions you make and the influence you have. So how do you position yourselves to make the best decisions and that maximum influence? You have to be intentionally curious and disciplined in seeing your business in seven perspectives. Perspective one, current reality. You need to be grounded in current reality. What got the business to where it's at? What were some of the mistakes made in the past? What was part of the secret sauce that got it to where it's at? What is happening in the market today? What's the competition saying? What's the legislative, the economic, the health, uh, the, the, the external factors that are gonna impact your current reality? How does the business operate? How does it really function? If you don't have both feet firmly planted in current reality, if you're not grounded in it, then the, the starting point for your business GPS is wrong. <laughs> if you don't get it, you become an ivory tower disconnected leader who your team doesn't trust your decision-making because you don't understand the business. So your influence starts to suffer your customers don't engage because you don't understand the business. Business starts to suffer. Your board loses confidence in you. Shareholders lose confidence in you. Influence wanes. Career limited. Current reality. You don't get this one right. Let's not move on. You've got to understand the business today. Yes, you can delegate the expertise and the deep dive functions to the CTO, the CFO, the CMO. You can. They need to know more about it than you do, but you need to know about it. Okay. Now we have the starting point. Perspective two, long-term vision. You need to see a better tomorrow. If leaders don't have a clear and compelling vision, clear enough to plan from, compelling enough to cause them to risk, to stretch, and to engage the heads and the hearts of themselves and those they lead, well, then they're not leading. Leaders, we need to take our teammates to a better tomorrow. Hmm. And if we don't have a clear and compelling vision that shows us destination, well, then we don't have that set point for our GPS. Current reality is where we're starting. We then anchor into long-term vision. That's where we're going. It's a better tomorrow. No one wants to join a leader who says, hey, all we're going to do is play defense and try to save this thing from falling off into the ditch. Yeah. Hey, that's an exciting way to spend the majority of my waking hours in my life. <laughs> no, thank you. So, so now what you've got is you've got your starting point and your your destination, some point 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road. Mm -hmm. That creates a big gap. And I call that the opportunity gap. Perspective three, strategic bets. You're going to make bets that are grounded in current reality and anchored to long-term vision. And these bets are well-informed bets where you've got the team's perspective, perspective four, you've got the customer's perspective, perspective five, they've spoken into these bets. So you understand which strategies you should invest in. They're not guarantees, but you're going to invest in them. You're going to resource them. You're going to figure out where they're going to fail. You're going to have stage gates, rhythms. These strategic bets move your current reality from 2020 to 2023. Hmm. Perspective three, strategic bets. You execute well when they're grounded in current reality and anchored in long-term vision. Those first three perspectives are all about planning and understanding and mechanics and tactics and strategy, communication. Perspective four is the team, not, hey, team, this is what you need to do, but leaders, listen to me on this one. Hey, team, what do I need to know? Hmm. 
What do you see? Mm -hmm. What do you think? What would you do if you were me? Where am I messing up? What do we need to do more of? How can I help you to be more successful? If I understand what my team sees and I let them know, I can't say yes to all 100 of what you see and need, but I take all of that and it helps me to make better decisions. And I'll explain to you why I'm making the decisions. Even if I say it's, it's left and you say it's right, mm -hmm. I've heard you, mm -hmm. right? But your voice matters. So now I listen to you. That's perspective four. Perspective five is the customer. You'll, you will definitely drive your business into a ditch once you start getting more excited about all of your fancy, shiny, and new without the input of the customer. Hmm. The best leaders are always figuring out what the customer needs today and what the customer is going to need tomorrow. So the best leaders actually spend time face-to-face -face with their customers. What's it like to do business with us? What do you wish we would change? Where's your business headed? Where are you struggling? Where do you see your business three years from now? What do you absolutely need from us in order to be more successful? And if you run a B2C business, mm -hmm. what's it like to buy our product or eat our server, you know, eat our product or whatever it is. And uh, what do we need to do to improve it in the years ahead? That's perspective five. Those five perspectives, if you deploy intentional curiosity in those, they'll impact perspective six, your role. Mm -hmm. What do you need to be doing every day, every week? Yeah. Perspective seven, the outsider. Who's that thinking partner that you process it all with? Those are the seven. Quick masterclass, everyone listening to this podcast episode. That's why you got to get a copy of Seven Perspectives. Some of you are thinking, man, Daniel's going really, really fast. I can't, I can't write it down. Well, yeah, that's why you go get the book. You won't have to, you won't have to write it down. Uh, as you, as you were sharing those, I, I, I was kind of picturing in my mind, Daniel, a, a CEO, maybe the person is apprehensive, an executive that's apprehensive, even about the whole coaching paradigm, because they've maybe never, I mean, high performers, hey, I've always been in a space where I know what I'm doing. Um, how, do you, how do you provide as a coach some sense of psychological safety and, and creating a safe place paradigm for these high perform, well-known leaders that you know uh, to get them to understand this, this is not going to pull away from how people view you. This is actually going to make you so much better if you lean into this process. Well, I think that's kind of comes back to that earlier conversation we had with regards to our clients. For the most part, our clients want the outsider mm -hmm. because they know they need a thinking partner. Mm -hmm. They know they need somebody to truly um, bounce their ideas off of that will truly help them. And they don't want a biased insider. So, you know, as an executive coach, my job is to help you to succeed. End of story. Now, sometimes that means you succeed outside of the business that you started in. Mm -hmm. And truthfully, that's best for the business. Mm -hmm. You know, if the leader doesn't want to be there anymore, or the leader has a different calling or passion, then the business doesn't want a half-hearted, half-engaged leader. So our clients, they want us. You know, they really do. They want somebody in their corner. So I don't really need to, I don't need to co convince them. There's quite a few people that you've worked with uh, that have said, Daniel, man, where were you 30 years ago? <laughs> where were you even 40 years ago? How often have you heard that statement? And then what what has hearing that statement prompted? I know you you teased it a little bit before, but what is hearing that statement prompt prompted you uh, to take up as an addition to the to the mission that you've already been uh, pushing ahead? Uh, you're doing me a favor, buddy, by teeing me up and allowing me to share with everybody a, a new not for profit called Set Path. And you'll start seeing the set path in the, uh, in the digital space within the next couple of months. But what we're going to do is we're going to give life planning and mentorship to every young human in America. Hmm. And uh, we want to help young people to build plans for their life so that um, they know how to accumulate net worth in all areas of their life. So that they craft a vision for the areas of their life that are most important and then they create the non-negotiable steps that they're going to repeat these patterns and behaviors that will enable them to be healthy and 
and make a difference in the lives of their families, their spouses, their partners, their businesses, their communities. And we're going to provide them with mentorship, somebody that will see the good in them, Hmm. encourage them, and uh, really help to guide them as they set their path. So set path is one you want to keep your your eyes and ears um, open uh, to in the next couple of months. We're getting ready to do our, our betas, but it's all around my life planning process that I've been using with business leaders for almost three decades. And if you want to pick up another book, it's in Living Forward. Uh, It's the model, that framework that helps business leaders to build plans for their lives. We're just going to make it very um, relevant for America's 20-some-year-old because right now is a rough time to be in the defining decade of your Mm. 20s. As you and I are recording, you know, we're a week away from an election on top of radical social injustice that has impacted you and me in some crazy ways Mm -hmm. on top of a pandemic that seems to be uh, spiking its ugly head again. And uh, we humans here in America in particular, you know, we've lost our routines and we've lost our freedoms and we've lost relationships and many have lost money and some have lost loved ones Yeah, and uh, lost, 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 lost can put you in a place of uh, helplessness. And I want to help people move out of helplessness, no matter what comes your way. I want to help people figure out how to take the right next step so that they can live the lives they were designed to live. Daniel, if you could, for a few moments, speak to, speak to a, a, a young leader. Uh, this individual was technically proficient. They did their job really, really well. And now they've been promoted. And now it's not as much about technical proficiency as it is about leading people. And they're nervous. They're scared. They don't know. They don't even know why they said yes to this promotion or opportunity. What, what piece of advice would you give to them? So you don't give a talk, nor do you write a book if you don't believe that it could change the trajectory of those that listen to you or read you. Mm -hmm. Becoming a coaching leader is now 14 years old. And it's my journey of how I grew as an uneducated manager leader into an executive coach who now walks side by side with some of the most amazing executives. My strategy, listen, ask, listen, ask again, then do everything you can to help that person to succeed. Have a vision, believe in a better tomorrow, and then put people in the right roles. Help them to to get into the roles to where they can flourish. Help them to take away the confusion and figure out what their top three to five high payoff activities are. Then resource them to where they can only do those things. Help them to win. I talk about that in becoming a coaching leader. I talk about that in the seven perspectives. Do that. And um, all day, every day, invest your time into helping others to flourish. And it's okay to be nervous. I tell you, buddy, I can tell you so many times where I walked into rooms and the insecurity was dripping off of me. Hmm. Like, what am I doing here? Like, how am I going to add value to this group of individuals? They're MBAs, they're doctors, they're leading global publicly held firms that are a hundred years old. Who am I? I'm surfer drummer guy. Like, come on, what am I doing here? And what I would do is I would just really press in and listen. And then when I found it, it's like, oh, I hear it. I hear it. Then I would have the courage to say, excuse me. Have you guys thought about this? Seems like this doesn't line up with that. Hmm. Is what you're saying this? Is this what you really mean to be communicating? Because this is what I'm hearing. Hey, how about the rest of you guys all hearing that? Have the courage to be a difference maker. Have the courage to just enter in, to listen, to care, to speak, to question. It's okay to be wrong. It's okay. You know, Pierre, a question that um, I like to help young people with that I hate to help old people with, (laughs) okay? A question that I love to help young people with, that I hate to help old people with is this, what word would you fill in the blank with? If I ask you, failure 
blanks me. What's that word that goes right in that blank? Failure blanks me. Vulnerability, brother. Yeah. What's that word? I would say failure kills me. Okay. Yeah. Where I want you, because you're still in your 30s, where I want you to be is teaches me. Hmm. Teaches me. I have failed so many times. So many times. Yeah. And every time I sit there and go, oh, wow, that didn't work. But I tried. I tried. Now, what do I need to learn? How do I not do that again? Hmm. How do I get better? Hey, young people, do you hear me? Failure does not define you. Failure cannot paralyze you. Failure cannot intimidate you, nor can it kill you. It's part of the journey. Yeah. And if you're going to lead, you're going to fail. And every one of us who have led successful organizations, we've had near deaths where we failed. Now, here's another thought for you. Young leaders, in business, you can put a lot of energy into your career. And you can begin to develop this false belief that you are your career. And all of a sudden, your identity becomes connected to the success that you enjoy in your career. Then when you retire, you no longer have that identity. And that's why the statistics show that so many people die after they retire hmm. because they put all of their energy into their career. But I will tell you that if you really want to flourish, understand that your job or career will not define you. So you want to accumulate net worth in all areas of your life. You take care of yourself. You pursue a rich and vibrant marriage. Don't let your career screw that up. You pursue being the absolute best mother or father. Don't let your career rob you of those only opportunities to see those little eyes looking at you for the first time when they're riding their bike. Don't be gone during that stuff. Mm -hmm. That's the stuff that makes for a rich and vibrant life. Now, let's connect that to the book, Seven Perspectives of Effective Leaders. If you are living your life plan, living forward, if you're, if you're living in a way that the people that are behind you, younger than you, following you, if they see how you're living life and you're not some crazed workaholic that's one dimensional, but they see that you're not only enjoying success at work, but you're enjoying success in life, you're now more attractive to follow. So your influence increases. Hmm. So, you know, just a, a couple tips from a guy who's a, a little bit further down the road than you, buddy. I got to ask it. I know you've answered it in several ways, but I need to ask it one more time in a different way. I've been on, on social media, especially on LinkedIn. And I see people getting jobs and job companies like to give swag. They'll give a water bottle. They'll give a T-shirt. They'll give a hoodie. They'll give pens. Uh, if a organization is just kind of just thinking about what else can we add to the toolkit of our new leaders who are joining our team? Why should seven perspectives of effective leaders be under consideration? Now, this is the thinking framework that's going to give every leader the ability to be calm, clear on what they need to be doing, confident in the decisions that they make because they're spending the right amount of time in each of those areas. And then it's going to give them the courage to lead forward. So there are businesses that you can walk into and their executive teams do their executive retreats around the seven perspectives. Their conversations, their meeting agendas are around the seven perspectives. All right. For the first half hour, we're just going to talk current reality. What do we need to know? What's changed? What are we seeing? What are the leading and lagging indicators showing us? Okay. Vision. Are we communicating it? Are we planning from it? Is it engaging you, Pierre? How are you living it out? What are you doing to promote it? Do you see yourself tied to it? They just move through these perspectives. Then they camp on that sixth perspective. And in the quarter ahead, what are you going to augment or change or do in your role in order to make the ultimate contribution to the organization? You do all that and then you get the perspective of the outsider. It's going to help you. It's going to stack the odds in your favor. And right now, you know, in the book, you heard, you, you read me saying uh, VUCA, mm -hmm. the term VUCA. Yeah. Term that was coined by uh, the uh, military back in the eighties because they had built strategy around a one enemy kind of uh, 
you know, uh, battlefield. And after the Cold War ended, that was crazy. It's like, okay, now we might have many enemies. So they said, we now live in a time of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So I'll ask you, Pierre, if you woke up every day and what you saw was volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, and you're a leader, what's the first emotion that comes to you? Fear. Dang right. Now, let's look at leaders. Does fear help you or does fear paralyze you? Fear paralyzes. Yeah. Fear, anxiety, that creates a manic response. That impacts your limbic system. Cortisol and, and adrenaline pulse through your body. It shuts your executive functions down in your brain. It creates relational limitations. It creates cardiovascular damage. It limits your ability to think creativity, create, creatively, creatively. So VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, that's where we're all living yeah. today Absolutely. in 2020. Absolutely. So um, we need a framework so we can think well. Seven perspectives will help you to think well, and it will help those around you to think well. well you, you got them hooked now, Daniel. Give us, I call this part of the, podcast at the end shameless plug time give us all the urls the social handles if there's you know okay. the youtube channel all of that so that we can okay. keep up with you and your work thanks bud so the book is the number seven perspectives.com and uh you can check it out there there's an assessment you can take that's gratis free that assessment will show where you're strong and where you have opportunity to grow in comparison to all of the others that are taking that assessment. So that's a good, nice benchmarking assessment. Uh, you can have access to the book there. Uh, just a little good thing for all of you folks to know. If you go to that website and go to where it's uh, where the book sold at the bottom of that website, you can see everything from Amazon to Barnes and Nobles, but you see the publisher, Baker Books. And Baker Books is offering the book at 40% off right now. Buy it from Baker. You'll get the best deal. Um, buildingchampions.com. That's my company. My team of coaches and I all live there and we walk alongside leaders like you all day long. You've got a lot of content and resources there. You can follow me on LinkedIn. My name, Daniel Harkavy. You can follow me on Facebook, Daniel Harkavy. And, uh, you know, I do a little bit on Twitter, but not much. Daniel, great conversation uh, today. I know I'm better for it. I know the Leading Wild Green audience will be better for it as well. And we wish you all, you and your organization, continued success as you continue building champions. Thanks for being my guest today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And I mean this sincerely. If I can help you as well, buddy, don't hesitate to reach out. Great conversation with Daniel Harkavy about his new book, Seven Perspectives of Effective Leaders. I knew you were going to enjoy it. Got links in the show notes so that you can learn more about Daniel and his work with Building Champions. And you can get your own copy of the book, The Seven Perspectives of Effective Leaders. I know some of you need a bit of coaching yourself. We're coming down to the end of the year. We're making preparations for 2021. You're trying to gauge your level of courage. For all of my emerging leaders, check out my Courageous Leadership Coaching Intensive. Go to PRCQuinn.com slash coaching. That's PRCQuinn.com slash coaching. That's all I got for this episode. So until next time, take care and God bless.